Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you a brand new keyword that was added in C Sharp 11 and I haven't really seen anyone talk about it, including Microsoft. The feature is actually in the language right now. If you are using the RC or anything after Preview 7 of .NET 7, you can use this keyword. And even though for most people, it is not something you will be using, for a very small subset of people that are building some really powerful stuff, I think this will be a game changer. If you like that content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchopsters.com. So let me show you what I have here. I have a simple console application. It has a, a program.cs and that's it. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new class and I'm going to call that class user. Now, by default, that's what this class looks like. It is a class user. And uh, in case you didn't know, the default modifier for classes like this is internal. So basically, this type, this class is visible within this assembly. Now, this could be obviously public. It could be protected. It could be many, many things. And I can also have a private class as long as it is nested. So I can have a sub user over here and I can use it within this user class. Now, the new keyword that's being added is the file keyword, and it is effectively another access modifier. So instead of having a public class user, I can have a file class user. I cannot have a public file class user. File is the access modifier. So it's like internal, it is like public, it's like private. Now it is file. So we call that the file access modifier and we say that the user has file scoped access. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if I go ahead and I duplicate this user class over here and say user2, then I can have two completely separate classes, as you can see, and I can actually just uh, split those horizontally so you can see them. And these are separate files, user.cs and user2.cs, but they both have the exact same name for their classes but they're not clashing with each other. The reason why that's the case is because the whole point of the file access modifier is to limit the visibility of that specific type in that specific file. So if I go to program.cs and I say var user equals new user, then I can't because both of them are file scoped. If I had a public class user, then this will work. And as you can see, this didn't break the other one because the other is still file scoped. It is not visible outside of this file. I mean, the moment I start having multiple public users, then we're going to have a problem. But I can have as many file class types as long as they're in separate files and not have them clash with each other. Now, you might be thinking, why would you want to have that? And the main benefit and the reason why they did this is source generators. Now, if you're someone who writes source generators, first, sorry, the experience is pretty bad right now. But if you're writing source generators, you would know that it is very hard to write code that writes code that doesn't clash with code that is already there in the assembly. Because let's say I wanted to write a source generator that reads some code and then one of the classes I'm generating in the source generator is named user. Well, what if you have a type named user, then we're going to have a class, we're going to have a problem. So what I would have to do as a source generator writer is pass your assembly, see what names you've used already, and then write code that deals with that and say, if there's a clash, then I'm renaming my class. And then I have to deal with that everywhere in my code. And it is an absolute nightmare. So now source generator writers don't have to worry about that. If they need a class like this in a specific file, they can just have the file modifier and name it whatever they want and know that there won't be a clash. And how does that work? Well, let's go to sharplab.io to see how this code is actually lowered. All right, so I have sharplab over here and on the right, we have the lowered code. It is in release mode. And on the left, we have the code that I will write that I want lowered. First, let's create a class user just to see what the normal code for a class looks like, the lowered code. So as you can see, it generates some um, embedded attribute and then a bunch of ref safety uh, rules attribute. But the main thing you care about is this one down here, internal class user. Nothing really changes. Like we said, by default, it is internal. If I was to make this public, then you would see this being a public class user, but it's very straightforward. Now, if I go and I change that to a find class, then as you can see, this is now an internal class with an impossible to replicate name. 
And what this basically means is that me as a source generator writer can just use the names I want. I can name something user and not worry about ever having to first pass your assembly, which means faster source generation generation. And then as a result, this significantly simplifies the code I have to write. So it's easier for me as well as a writer to deal with this. It is very small, but if you are writing source generators, this is literally a game changer for you. Now you're not limited to classes over here. This can actually be applied to things like records or structs or enums. This can be applied on delegates in so many different things. So it's not really just a class thing. It is just another access modifier you have to keep in mind. And if you have like a partial class, so file partial class user, then you can have multiple versions of that partial class in a single file. If this was not partial, then you would have an issue because this is the original user class and there can only be one in that file. Now, how does that work in a more realistic scenario? Well, let's see. I'm going to delete all that and create a file interface I question. And this will only have one method called provide answer. And that's it. And then I'm going to create a file class called hidden question. So both of these things are only visible within this file. And this thing will have a single a method called generate answer. And it will just return the value. Now it doesn't implement iQuestion, it is just another file class in this file. And then I can go ahead and have a public class question, and that can implement iQuestion, even though it is a file scoped. And of course I have to implement my method. But what I can do is I can instantiate now this file scoped class. So I can say hidden question equals new hidden question. And I can return hidden question dot get uh, answer. And I'm going to have to make this one public. Um, and I'm going to say generate answer. So now I can go to my program.cs and I can say new question type user dot provide answer. And now I can call that method, which is using that file scoped item here, which is implementing and file scoped interface. You can actually do a bunch of things here and combine different approaches. But this kind of shows you that even though these are file scoped, they can be used here and be not quite exposed, but utilized in something that has an elevated level of access like public. And this doesn't have to be public. This could also be, of course, internal and this would still work. But what do you think? Are you someone who's writing source generators? Have you tried to write source generators and you've seen this being a problem? So you're happy for the fix? Is it something you will never really use? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.